everyone. Good afternoon, thank you. Well, I want to welcome you all here to the 2017 Daniel Burnham Forum on Big Ideas. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Cynthia Bowen. I am the president of the American Planning Association. This event was established in 2012 as a way to bring attention to critical issues affecting communities and what we in our profession can be doing to address those issues. The forum aims to speak at important ideas of today while casting an eye toward how those ideas might inform our work and the places that we serve. By making it the kickoff to our policy and advocacy conference, we put the forum at the intersection of public policy and planning concerns. We've had a range of speakers and topics over the last five years, from professors to mayors. And I have no doubt that tonight's program is going to, again, be informative and provocative. Tonight, we're focusing on data. We will look at political challenges to our federal data and our statistical agencies. We will discuss how data is changing the way cities are managed and how policies are developed. We will consider how we can promote innovation in planning that matches innovation in technology. And we will look at how these tools can foster better public engagement in the process. This forum is being held in the context of period, in a, in a period of political uncertainty. The federal budget threats to essential resources like the census are all too real for us. And the tenor of public debate that devalues evidence-based policymaking is a serious challenge. Recognizing this context, APA has made the protection of data one of our three federal policy priorities, along with infrastructure and equitable, inclusive communities. We've elevated data because it's so important to the good work that we do as planners and to our communities. We also want to spur the advocacy of members to stand up for our values and our vision for the future. You know, we have seen some impressive results as planners are taking up this call to action. One example of that is that we've more than doubled the network of grassroots advocates since the beginning of this year. And we'll bring, be bringing more planners, more than ever, to our Planners Day on the Hill on this Tuesday. And I was in stereo there, and now you can't hear me at all. <laughs> If you haven't already joined the Planners Advocacy Network, this will be the only time I'm encouraging you to take out your phone right now and go and join. You know, there really are important advocacy issues related to data, and they're under debate right now. From funding levels to how we measure risk and resiliency, your voice to this effort is incredibly important and we really need you to be speaking up. Good data and new data tools are at the center of so many of the important work that we as planners do and necessary for our local leaders to govern. Whether using NOAA's Digital Coast to plan for resiliency and hazard mitigation or the American Community Survey information to understand local trends and housing, poverty, and inequality. Sound science and good statistics are essential ingredients to effective and inclusive planning. Our work is not just to defend the current system, but to advocate for better tools that really help us create better and smarter cities. 
To walk us through tonight's landscape and tomorrow's outlook, let me introduce this year's Daniel Burnham Forum speaker, John Thompson. John was nominated by President Obama and confirmed by the US, by the US Senate as the 24th Census Bureau Director in 2013. He has served in that post until June of this year when he left to become the Executive Director of the Council of Professional Associations on Federal Statistics. In his new post, he is leading advocacy and technical efforts to ensure a successful 2020 census and advance federal data programs. While at the Census Bureau, he was instrumental in setting the stage for 2020 census as well as working across the federal government on advancing the use of federal data in innovative new applications and programs. So John is gonna come up and make some remarks and then we're going to invite a couple of other panelists up and we're gonna engage in a dialogue and discussion with you. So with that, John. All right, that'd be good, Trevor. Thank you. Well, I am, uh, I'm delighted uh, to be here talking about um, data. Um, it's refreshing to see data at the top of a uh, priority list. Um, <laughs> no, I'm, I, it, it, it really is. I mean, just, just so you know, I, I, um, I go back a long ways at the Census Bureau. I started my career uh, at the Census Bureau in 1975, and I stayed there through 2002. The last job I had as a career person at the Census Bureau was um, as the career executive in charge of the 2000 Census, which um, was an exciting time. I, got to work with a lot of people then. And then I went and worked at the University of Chicago's um, National Opinion Research Center, which again is a research organization that produces data, federal da data, mostly federal data, but it produces a lot of data and analysis. So um, I've just spent my whole career either producing, consuming, or advocating for, for federal data, and I'm glad to keep doing it. So what is COPAFs, or the Council of Professional Associations on Federal Statistics? Let me just talk a little bit about this. Um, it was founded in 1981. Um, at the time, there was great concern among a number of users of federal statistics that federal statistics were in for, for a trying and challenging time. I just set the stage, Ronald Reagan had just become president and it campaigned on a, a program of austerity and a person that, I don't know if many of you know, named David Stockman was the director of OMB who also had as an agenda to um, uh, uh, <laughs> reduce the federal uh, footprint in a lot of areas and, um, and there was great concern. So COPAS was formed by these associations and the first executive director was a woman named Kathy Wallman if that name sounds familiar, Kathy Wallman later um, became the chief statistician of the United States and was in that position for quite a while, having retired this past January. So um, it, it's, it's great to be um, following uh, in her footsteps. Um, so if you look on our website, you'll see that our membership um, produces and consumes just a wide array of federal statistics, almost in most departments, and because it's a very broad membership, and in most scientific di disciplines. And our goal is to advance is advancing excellence in federal statistics. So let me talk a little bit about federal statistics, and I have a method here because I want to show you some of the challenges, and then later on we can talk about some things that might help them. So. The federal statistical system um, is coordinated by the Office of the Chief Statistician of the United States. And this is actually in statute because in the Paperwork Reduction Act revision of 1994, it set up the Chief Statistician of the United States, who's now a woman named Nancy Potok, 
um, to coordinate the activities of the federal statistical system and chair what's called the Interagency Council on Statistical Policy, which represents uh, the 13 primary st federal statistical agencies. And here are the primary federal statistical agencies. Now, the one thing I want you to, to keep in mind here, and I'm going to show you a few slides that shows a lot of data that these agencies produce, but um, one of, one of the, the challenges is that, is that there are statutes and laws in place that prohibit the agencies from sharing data. And this introduces a great, and I'm, I'm, I'm serious. It, 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 um, I, I, was, I, was, I was at the Census Bureau. The Census Bureau actually has in its statute that, that we will use administrative records, other federal data to the greatest extent possible to accomplish our mission. So the Census Bureau had <clears throat> great authority to ask for data from any agencies. And of course, I found throughout the years that the other agencies have great authority to say, no, you can't have <laughs> the data. Um, but Census does have, uh, they do have agreements with, with many of these agencies to use data for specific purposes, in particular um, the IRS, because tax data can be very informative for a number of purposes, but um, there, there are real limitations to um, <clears throat> making real advantage of this data and, and introducing significant efficiencies into the federal government. So, and I'm sure you all use um, a lot of this data, but this is just an example of some of the important data that the federal statistical system generates uh, you can start with what's constitutionally mandated, which is the reapportionment of, of the Congress, and then you have redistricting. Um, uh, principal key economic indicators, a number of the agencies produce these, and they're, they're very important to describe the economy. When they come out, you see the markets move instantly. Um, the American Community Survey, which uh, was mentioned. Uh, employment, labor force, I, I won't read all of this, but you know, the, it, it, it spans the, the breadth. The National Center for Health Statistics has incredibly important uh, data on, on uh, opioid addiction, so that's really important. Um, if you get over into agriculture, you'll notice that um, there's a lot of data on food security and farm productivity. There's data there on obesity. There's data on crime victimization, and in particular, there, there is data on victimization that is not reported um, to the police. So they actually measure that on the National Crime Victimization Survey, which is, which is very important. There's a lot of, of information on energy uses, fuel reserves, our education process, uh, how we're doing on, on producing scientists and engineers, um, of course, veteran status and highways, which I'm sure a lot of you use a lot of that information. Um, so what are some of the challenges for federal statistics? Well, just in general, these challenges have, some of these challenges have been developing over time. Um, it's getting harder and harder to collect information using uh, in-person or in-business techniques, direct contact with a household or business. It's getting more and more challenging. Response rates are going down, costs are going up. Um, there are expanding demands for data, for much more timely data, for much more granular data, um, much more local area data, and I know you all are great consumers of this and you'd love to see a lot more data on a much more rapid basis. Um, there are just growing concerns about protecting privacy. It's getting harder and harder to produce uh, tabular data in, in, a, in a world where there's so many alternative data sources and ways to, um, to, to take away the privacy protections that are associated with data. And by this, I, mean, I don't mean NOAA data, in that, that, that's not private, but I mean data from the American Community Survey, the Census, or some of the other surveys. Um, and there are, um, in, a lot of concerns that keep growing about federal data collection. So um, one, one of the challenges I faced at Census was there was a lot of concerns about the American Community Survey. 
and we had to do a lot of work and get a lot of, uh, ed educate a lot of um, folks to advocate for the American Community Survey. Um, it, it was a great concern. There are still concerns about federal data collection that we see every day um, in, in the papers. Um, and finally, I'll come back to this funding constraints. So um, the, federal, the federal agencies have been really, really challenged with funding uh, over the years. It has been at best flat. We had a meeting at COPAFs in June. I was there as the Census Bureau Director then. And we were talking about our, our funding for um, FY17 and FY18. And um, some of the statistical agencies were, were glad they'd only gotten a 5% cut. Um, because some of the other areas in the domestic program fared a lot worse. But still, the problem, the problem with this is, is that we're at a time where we need to do innovation in federal statistics and the federal agencies just don't have the resources to really be as innovative as they can to, to, um, to solve some of their problems. I'll, I'll put this graph up just to illustrate what, I, what I'm saying. What this is are the response rates for the current population survey. I don't know if you know what the current population survey is. It's the survey the Census Bureau conducts. It's what's used to produce the month-to-month -month change in unemployment that BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, uh, releases every month. Um, and I, I use this because this is, and I can say this because I worked in, this, in the survey business for a long time <laughs> in different, in private and public. The current population survey is the highest response rate volunteer survey that the United States government produces and collects. And you can see here that the response rates sort of go up and down, up and down, they fluctuate a little bit, and they get a little bump right around 2010. That, that, that's the big bump there. It's the 2010 census because there was a lot of publicity with the 2010 census. There was a $300 million advertising and partnership campaign, and it lifted up every, every agency, even private sector agencies. But after that, you can see there's just a downward trend. And that, that's just, it, and I, I can assure you at Census, we tried everything we could <laughs> to revert that trend, but it, um, it just wasn't happening. So um, that's, that's, that's the illustration. Other surveys are the same thing. The surveys that the Census Bureau uses to produce um, the monthly retail uh, trade indicators are down in the 30 percentiles, and that's a key economic indicator. So. That's, a, that's a, a big challenge. So let's talk about the 2020 census, which um, is one of my favorite topics. So <laughs> um, so just as a little background, the census process from 1970 through 2010 was pretty simple. Um, and in 1970, this was actually a groundbreaking um, uh, event. But uh, it's prepare an address list and as part of that, you have to be able to assign geographic codes to the address list with automatically so you know where the housing units are without visiting them. Mail a paper questionnaire, capture the information from the mail returns, and then conduct in-person enumeration of non-responders using paper and pencil. And, that la and th this, is, this has been the process that's, that's been used since 1970. Various aspects of this have been uh, increased in their ability to automate. I mean, the census had a homemade way to capture information from return paper questionnaires in 1970. They've since taken that to, you know, digital imaging and, and character, intelligent character recognition. But the in-person enumeration of the non-responders using pencil and paper has been why the costs of the census have been going up exponentially over the years. And they've been exceeding the increase from inflation and population growth significantly. And there, there's lots of charts that show this. And the reason is, is that as the country gets more diverse and communication strategies get more diverse and you're using paper and pencil, the only solution is you have to throw more bodies at it. And that's why the costs go up so, so fast. It's been a huge 
requirement to just increase it. So um, the reason I went back to the Census Bureau um, was, in fact, I, I had never planned to go back to the Census Bureau. I, I, um, but, but when I left, I couldn't envision the, op the technological opportunities that, that now exist today to change the way you take the census. So it was time to go back and help them. So there, 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 are, there, are, there are four new things they're doing and one old thing, which I'll get to, which is very important. So they used to have to walk the whole country to prepare an address list. Now they don't have to walk the whole country to, to review the list because they can do it in an office using a lot of geospatial tools. Um, they're still going to have to walk about 25, 30 percent of the country, but that's a lot less expensive than walking the whole country. Um, and I know this it might be a little hard to believe, but the Census Bureau is going to use the internet for the first time <laughs> as a self-response option in 2020. And, um, <laughs> uh, and then, by the way, they'll still, you know, if, if somebody doesn't, if, if by 2020 there's somebody that doesn't have access to the internet, they'll, they'll let them either respond by paper or call in. But so they're not, they're not ignoring that. They're going to make some intelligent use, new use of administrative records and third party data to reduce the workload. And the most important thing they're doing, not the most important, but the greatest cost savings are coming from re-engineering the field operations to use mobile technology. Now, they had a problem with this in 2010. Uh, the reason was they were trying to build a mobile device. Well, now, you know, we just use these things. And um, the, good, the good thing is, is that they work. And census has been testing using these. They, they work really well. Um, so that, that, that's the big, um, the big uh, challenge. Um, I'll get back to what, what's been happening here, though, in a minute. So the, the final thing is what's called integrated communications and partnership. And I can't stress the importance of this enough. What this means is that you have advertising, but it's not, not just national advertising. It's advertising that's really based on communities. So you get the right message out for the right communities. And then partnership is where the Census Bureau hires a number of individuals that go work with local communities, local governments. They do a number of activities. And they do two really important things. They get the word out in terms of why the census is important and why it's important for that particular local community or group, because there's, there's different needs for different communities. It's, it's not a one message fits all. And the other important thing they do is communicate that the, the, the responses to the census are completely safe and completely confidential. And just so you all know, <coughs> the, um, the census uh, authorities comes from Title 13 U.S. Code, that supersedes even the Patriot Act. So the Census Bureau, the Census Bureau doesn't, ha doesn't give their data to anyone. And, and by statute, they, 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 they keep it. Um, but, you know, you can't, they, you, need, you need somebody that people will believe, to tell them that, because um, I just can't do that. Um, so, what, so let me just show you this. This is something that, that I, I used to use the Census Bureau. And what this represents is the 2010 census undercounts measured at the county level. And the, the 2000 census, by the way, is, isn't what they call statistically different from 2010, so it looks pretty much the same. And then what you see is the 1990 census undercount, but this is applied to a population uh, that's been carried forward to 2015. So the population's changed a lot since 1990, but this would assume that, that you got the undercounts you got in 1990. And you can see some pretty dramatic differences between those two uh, charts. And they're both on the same scale. And the big difference between 1990 and 2000 and 2010 was in 2000, the Census Bureau started doing paid advertising with the number of targeted advertising companies and they started doing this paid partnership. 
They did that in 2000, they did it in 2010. They didn't do it in 1990. And so, that, that, and that's really the big difference between those censuses. So it, it really illustrates the effect of the importance of that program. So what are the challenges to the 2020 census? Well, there's a lot. Um, they've got to do a lot of automation. Um, and uh, the automation, if it had been fully funded, would have saved significant amounts of money. It would have saved over $5 billion from the cost of repeating the 2010 census in 2020. Uh, however, if you look, this is right on the Census Bureau's website, but if you look at what the Census Bureau has requested from 2012, when the 2020 census planning started, through 2017, um, they, were, they were over $200 million below what they've been appropriated. And let, let, me, they're, they're, let me explain a couple things about that number. That is how much they have not been funded. There are estimates um, by uh, some different groups, one of them, the one Mary Jo Huxima, hope I got that right, <laughs> represents um, that estimate that the census may need as much as $300 million in 2018 to catch up. Um, and it doesn't look, from my perspective, I don't think they're going to get $300 million. But they better, anyway, but they're underfunded. I think everybody, all the advocates agrees there that they need more money. So what has happened at census? So census has been forced to prioritize their operations so they can really develop the automation. If they can't do the automation, if the automation doesn't work, then they can't really produce an accurate census. So the automation has to work, and they've been focusing on the automation. And uh, the last time I saw the Census Bureau, which was uh, a couple weeks ago at, at their um, uh, science, scientific advisory committee meeting, they were still on track to conduct a complete test of the automation in 2018. It's called the 2018 end-to-end -end test, which actually has started already with preparing an address list. They have a census day, April 1st, 2018. And, and anyway, they're going to run it end-to-end -end and has test all the operations. However, they've had to reduce the amount of in-field testing that they've done, so they canceled the test in Puerto Rico. They canceled tests on some Indian reservations, and they were going to do the end-to-end -end test fully in three sites, and now they're doing it in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, they've also had to defer uh, complete modernization of every operation. So what this means is they've had to increase the in-person address listing, and they've had to return to some paper-based methods for selected areas or population groups, um, some rural areas, for example. Now, the, the thing is, from an accuracy standpoint, it's not going to be that bad because they used these methods in 2010, and they worked pretty well. 2010 was the most accurate census we've had. It's just that they're going to be more expensive. Uh, but what is a pretty big concern to a lot of the stakeholders is that they've had to defer their communications and partnership program, many activities for that. And these are the activities that give you the accuracy. You know, I had that chart up there. And we, what, we, what no one wants to see is a, a chart like that. And it becomes incredibly important to get an accurate census. I mean, you know, you're talking about proper apportionment, proper drawing of districts. Well, at least you have the data to challenge improper <laughs> drawing of districts. But, but the data is there. The Census Bureau puts the data out that's used for redistricting, so everybody can use it. Um, and uh, but it's also used for fund allocation. Um, Professor Andrew Reamer uh, just issued a report which estimated that there's at least 600 billion dollars on an annual basis that gets allocated based on census data. Uh, more importantly than that, the census is used for the controls of almost all the demographic data collections in the United States. And by controls, I mean they use these to weight up the surveys to be fully representative of, of populations. And so if the census contains errors in it, then those errors are carried over 
to the surveys that collect federal data. The census also is the basis for the population uh, estimates that come out every year and funds are allocated on those. And if the census is short on those, that gets carried over the entire decade. So <laughs> a, a good census is really, really, really important to everyone um, that, 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 uses, that, that relies on any kind of federal data for planning or for funding or decision making. Um, so uh, increased funding is just going to be critical for an accurate census in 2020. And if it doesn't come in fiscal year 2018, which we're in the process of now, and there's a lot of work going on to try to get more money for the census in 2018, but if it doesn't come there, then it's got to come in 2019 or in a lot of money. I mean, if you look at some of the census budget documents, they were estimating they needed about two and a half billion in 2019. They're in the process of doing a new, well, they probably, there's a new full cycle cost estimate that's, that's making its way through um, the government that'll be used in the, the, the supporting the 2019 appropriation. And that will have a new estimate for fiscal year 2019. I'm sure, <laughs> I haven't seen it, but I'm sure it's going to be a lot bigger than two and a half billion dollars. And then the Congress is going to have to fund, appropriate the money that they ask for. That's just going to be incredibly important. Um, so, just to end, to talk about some 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 things, um, some opportunities. Um, there's there's a lot of interest in a number of areas to look at integrated statistical data from surveys, administrative uh, records, and commercial data. Now, the idea is there if you, if you do this, it'll start producing a lot more accessible data, a lot more timely data to use. Um, the issue is, is that there's, there's got to be a lot of work that goes on to fully make use of integrating data sets. So there, there's a report that came out by the National Academy of Sciences, Bob Groves, who was the former director of the Census Bureau and is now the provost of Georgetown, led that effort, which describes some of the, the, the issues and processes around that. Um, the chief statistician of the United States has a number of initiatives going forward here. One of them really is to define, is to update the standards that the Office of Management and Budget issues to guide quality surveys. And so, for example, if you produce a key economic indicator that's based in part on a survey, in part on administrative records, and in part maybe on some credit card data, transaction data, how do you know how good that, that, that indicator is? And so this is why they need to do this work to produce standards and so that that's a big opportunity another huge opportunity is um, the Commission on evidence-based policy making this was this was a bipartisan Commission that was established by um, by Ryan speaker Ryan and Patty Murray of Washington Senator Murray it was a bipartisan initi initiative they had 15 commissioners that were bipartisan and they just issued their report. And it's available at www.cep, Commission on Evidence-Based Policymaking.gov. Um, and they make a number of recommendations, but in particular, they're, they're, the heart of it is, is finding ways to bring together federal data from the different agencies, not, not that you had that siloed structure, to do much more efficient work for government. It's, it, and it's a huge opportunity. They're in the process now of, well, the commission actually goes away at the end of September, but the Bipartisan Policy Center has, um, has achieved, uh, secured some funding and is going to be continuing the work of the commission. And the, the first challenge is going to be getting some legislation passed to start this moving. So it's, it's a really exciting opportunity. Um, a couple other things that, that are going on, I'm sure you all are working on this in terms of, of using data in good government. I, I know when I was at, at Commerce um, under the previous administration, there was just a lot of work going on with public-private uh, data partnerships. 
there's, there's one, one example of this, and there, there's many. One was the Opportunity Project. And you can see it at opportunity.census.gov. But what this did was it brought together cities, and it brought together some private companies, and it brought together government data, a lot of census data, a lot of uh, HUD data, um, to build product, products that would help communities. And some of the big data um, providers got involved in this. So Zillow got involved in it. Um, Amazon got involved in it. There, there were different, different, different ways, and they built products to help communities uh, perform better. So that, that, would, that was a great initiative to use city data, government data, and, and, and even some third-party private data to build some really exciting projects. Um, I just have to put in the plug right now. The Census Bureau is getting ready to do the local update of census addresses. I know that many of you will be working in this. I, I can tell you that the Census Bureau is getting really excited about this because the responses they've gotten, positive responses, are at an all-time high. They've never had as many respo positive responses about participating in this program. This is the program where the Census Bureau actually gives local governments their address list and takes back corrections. So it's a great opportunity to get a good address list. And then there are just a number of access tools. I've listed a few here um, that the Census Bureau has. Uh, one of them is what they call their city SDK, which um, is a way to, to get more easily get information from the Census Bureau's APIs. They have something called Business Builder, which puts together American communities survey data and economic data, mainly county business patterns, to, um, to, 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 in a way that's easy to use. They started doing this thinking maybe they could help some small businesses utilize their data. I know it's actually pretty easy to use because uh, my son was asking me some questions. One, one of my sons, about he wanted to think about starting up a business. And I said, well, you know, you just, just try it. So he did, and he was actually able to pull some data down which I, I found to be amazing because my son is, this particular son, is not computer literate at all. <laughs> um, and, uh, and on the map, I, I would really encourage you to look at on the map. It, it brings together employer, employee data, and survey data. It'll let you draw any kind of polygon you want and provide you information uh, for it. So it's also there. Um, and I've also seen that there's been a lot of use of local data and some uh, using big data techniques to utilize local data to really do some good things uh, for communities. One of them, and this is only because I went to Virginia Tech and I, I, and I work with Virginia Tech, but I know that, that um, they're doing a lot of work with, with the city of Arlington to utilize things like 911 calls and emergency calls and analyze these and make sense out of them so they can say, you know, what, what, are the, what, are, what are the times, where should we anticipate getting calls? But it's just utilizing local data, using some big data techniques and some, to really make sense out of just massive data for, for communities. And I've, I've seen a lot of that going on. So with that, I'm done. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, John. That was very, very interesting and informative. So now our conversation on this important issue and some of the issues that you've raised, John. I'd like to invite a couple more people to join you on the stage. So first, please welcome Mary Jo Hooksema. She's the Director of Government Affairs for the Population Association of America and the co-chair of the Census Project. And also welcome Dr. Nadar Afsalan from Redlands University, who is also the chair of APA's technology division. So welcome. Thank well, thank you all for coming in and talking about this important topic for APA. So why don't we start off, Mary Jo, why don't you tell us a little bit about your organization Sure. And as the leader of the Census Project, what can people do, what can our planners do to advocate 
for federal data and for statistics. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and to have this opportunity to talk to all of you about the Census Project. APA has been very actively involved in our efforts, um, but for those of you who don't know what the Census Project is, it is a broad-based, diverse uh, network of national, state, and local organizations, some 600 plus actually, um, representing the interests of business, civil rights, labor, housing, human services, and scientific organizations among its, among its ranks. And all of us have come together in support of um, advocating for funding for the uh, decennial census and for maintaining a mandatory, fully funded American Community Survey. Um, we do a number of things through the Census Project, uh, not the least of which is to ensure that our members are informed when there are attempts to um, undermine support for funding the census and also the ACS. So we will put out information about maybe amendments that are going to be offered on the House or Senate floor that would affect funding. And so then in turn, our member organizations can um, issue action alerts, if you will, so members can be activated to contact specific representatives or senators and urge them to vote the right way on these amendments. We also were very involved, as was APA as a member of the um, Census Project, in um, efforts dating back to 2012 to ensure that the American Community Survey did not become a voluntary survey. John um, reflected on this point in his, com in his uh, remarks. There have been efforts in Congress in the recent past to try to make the ACS a voluntary survey, and uh, we're very tuned into those, um, those attempts that have fortunately fallen a little bit to the wayside, but we remain very vigilant. Okay. So um, being tuned in to those action alerts when they come about is important, I think, as members of, AP, of APA to respond to those. But proactively, um, we'd love to see people get more engaged, particularly at this critical time in planning for the decennial census. I mean, it, it's not only important to react to action alerts, but also when people come, policymakers from Congress as well as state and local government or in your community to engage them in town halls and meetings that you may be privy to and to talk not only about the ports of funding um, the Census Bureau as well as other statistical agencies, but to speak about the, how you use the data in ways that will mean something to them, the applied uses of the data, how communities benefit from these data. I worked for two members of Congress Otherwise, they always wanted to know how, at the end of the day, how constituents would benefit from investments in statistical agencies. Um, and lastly, another thing you can do if you're interested in being more proactive is um, write op-eds when they're, um, again, in sort of reacting to action alerts when you've, there have been threats to statistical agencies or collection of data. And this is something, again, working with Jason and Trevor and the team here in DC, they can give you the guidance, sort of building upon the information that groups like the Census Project are putting out to help you craft and market an op-ed when the timing is right. So those are some immediate thoughts I had about ways in can, you can get involved. Great, yes. thank you for that. Say, Nader, why don't you talk to us a little bit about APA's division as it's been active on data and smart city issues. So really, what do you see as priorities for the organization in this area and how are your members using these government data resources in planning issues? Thank you very much, Cynthia. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm very glad to be among all of you. Um, we have uh, more than 20 divisions in APA, and technology division is one of them. I'm the chair of the technology division and co-chair of the Smart Cities and Sustainability Task Force. Um, our cities are data obese right now. So <laughs> it's real. a lot of our cities, I think, are data obese, or they are getting there. So. When you have obesity issue, what, what, what would you do? You, you go and see a doctor and you change your habits and you change your, I don't know, diet. Uh, the most important thing is to change your lifestyle. This is what a lot of people would advise you to do. So I think a lot of cities and organizations need to change their, um, their, their, their style in collecting, gathering, using, analyzing data and interpreting that and turning that into action. So this is uh, what we basically do in the technology division to help planning organizations and also industries who are uh, using different types of data for public good or public action or community-based planning uh, to think about how they can use uh, governmental data, federal data, and how they can integrate that with local data sets. So, um, 
talking about local data sets, uh, it, it, the, there is a history about that. We've been talking about that for a while. Uh, we've been talking about using social media data and citizen generated data for more than 10 years from now, but I think we're not still there. And in fact, a lot of our organizations are, I think are um, not that focused. In a lot of cases, I see organizations uh, are not focused on the goals. They are more focused on, oh, we have all this data. What are we going to do with that? So I think, I think the first step is to think about, is still to focus on the goal itself other than the data. So instead of looking at the technology or data and see what are we going to do with this, instead of that, it would be still going back and stepping back and see, OK, so this is our goal. Instead of being distracted by a lot of amazing things you can do with that data, thinking about, OK, what's our goal? We're going to stick with that and how we are going to deal with this. So I think that's, that's one way to deal with that data obesity issue. So uh, sticking with goal, um, I think, would be, would be important. Having clear objectives, um, thinking about partnerships and collaborations. Um, a lot of planning organizations are, are still not ready to think about how to use that data. Um, a lot of planning students, as a faculty, I deal with a lot of planners and planning students. I think we're not still teaching students in a way that they are really ready to deal with this uh, data analysis and interpreting big data in a lot of cases. So we're getting there, but we're a little bit slow on that. So providing opportunities for planners to have those kinds of partnerships and collaboration with other organizations instead of thinking about how they can use this data and how they can, uh, how they can partner um, with other organizations to help with that process is important as well. Um, uh, there are ideas about thinking about bottom-up and top-down approaches. Planners love uh, bottom-up approaches, but I think in this case, uh, I'm sorry, I should say that we definitely need top-down approaches as well. So uh, thinking about the use of uh, uh, federal data as well as local data and thinking about how these two can emerge is, is extremely important. Um, I, I, as part of my role as the chair of the technology division, I. Um, sometime interact with very small towns. I, I can feel that some of those towns and organizations have, are a little bit scared of touching these kinds of things, but I think uh, this is not an issue for small towns with uh, limited staff. It's an issue with a lot of cities. I, I work with the city of LA as well, and I can see that they are struggling with this issue as well. So I think it would be good to, to tackle, experiment, iterate, think about your experiment, and go back and we do it. So this is what the technology division does in, in terms of trying to provide opportunities for professional development for planners and also different uh, professionals from different organizations. OK, thank you very much. Let me follow up, John, with one of the points that you had talked about, about our data being completely, or the Census Bureau looking for the data to be completely safe and secure and the fact that they are moving towards an internet basis to collect that data. Um, how do you calm the fears of the public, especially with the recent Equifax data hack and the thoughts out there about um, hacking into our election process? What are the things that, you know, what are the things that we could do as planners to um, encourage our citizens and our residents because this data is so critical. And what are the things maybe that the government could be doing or other partner partners in this process to help ensure that that's secure? And Nader, Nader you might have some thoughts on this as well from the technology side. So um, on the positive side, Census um, really does a, a really good job of um, keeping the data safe. And there's all different levels they have. They, they have, they, have a, they have a very good strategy. They work with, um, with the Department of Homeland Security experts there. They happen to be really close to the National Institute of Science of Standards. Um, so that, that's all really good. But this is, again, why um, the communications uh, is so important, because part of the communications program will be explaining to people in terms they can understand <laughs> 
why um, the data is safe and why the Census Bureau is confident that it can protect the information that they have. But that's, but, and again, that, that, that's just another message that has to get out. So when Census gets funded up to start doing this, I'm sure they'd be happy to give you all kinds of information, you know, to, to get that out. But, but again, this is, this is why it's becoming critical that the Census get the proper funding to move forward. Okay. Not um, or so I, I, will, I would like to tie it to um, not only privacy, but also issues of ethics. Mm -hmm. um, in general, I think uh, we, need, we need more focus on ethical concerns of using data, how it is used and how it is not used. So um, in the code of ethics, I'm going back and, and I have, um, I'm a planner, so I'm going to talk about the code of ethics for AICP, of course. So in the code of ethics, we only have, I think, two paragraphs just talking about ethical concerns of using data from social media and all that. We've had one or two webinars on that topic, which is, I think they are very valuable, but it's not enough. So I would love to see we at APA focusing on on this topic and even thinking about modifying the code of ethics to include those ideas and, and those solutions. Um, I'm working with uh, Lisa Schweitzer from USC, University of Southern California, on, on some of these topics, and I'll be happy to talk more about that. But um, I think we as planners should be probably more cautious about how we are using data where where we can use it and where we cannot use it. And there is a huge confusion uh, from our side as planners about, about ethical usage mm -hmm. of this, this data. Okay, good. Good thought. Mary Jo, did you have anything you wanted to add? Or? Well, not, not really, although I think the Commission on Evidence-Based Policymaking and the recommendations they've issued, it's an important opportunity maybe to capitalize on the the very idea that NADA has suggested that APA embrace this opportunity to consider you know, adopting some recommendations, some guidelines, if you will, for use of data and, and to link that to the recommendations that I think are really gonna catch fire and it'd be important for all of you to be a part of this, this effort moving forward to not only enhance access to data but to do so responsibly and, and to be a part, to be leaders in that effort. Okay, thank you. So let me ask you this question and this could be, any one of our panelists can start first with this. So um, we often quote this around here, around APA. So Daniel Patrick Moynihan is credited with saying that everyone is entitled to their own opinion, but not their own facts. <laughs> <laughs> and so do you worry about how fake news, the skepticism of science, and the narrow channels of information that's getting out to the public is hurting government and public debate on policy. And so what are the things that can be done about that? <laughs> yeah, with that one, who, want, who wants to start with that one? John, would you like John, to John, yeah, do you want to go John. first? <laughs> Poor John. No, 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 it's, it's a, it's a, it's a huge concern. There's, um, there, there's, a, there's some concerns about sort of fake news being used to really, in, in a very um, targeted way, to try to discourage certain population groups from being counted. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like saying, like, like fake news that the Census Bureau is giving your data to the, you know, ICE, things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, for, and it would be fake. So that, that's, that's one thing. The other thing, though, that uh, I also think uh, is sometimes concerning are the um, unfounded attacks on, on data. So, you know, there, there have been attacks made that the Bureau of Labor Statistics is just cooking mm -hmm. the uh, unemployment statistics, which it doesn't do. But that, that does make it hard for the Bureau of Labor Statistics sometimes to be viewed as credible. So um, you all, I think everybody here understands that the data that, that the federal government puts out 
the federal statistical system is, you know, objective, unbiased, as high quality as it can be. Um, so helping that is good, but, but it's, it's a real challenge, though, to deal with a lot of the uh, issues that come up. Is there any fear or thought that um, this could be used and the things that are happening with the shortness or the shortening on funding and the fact that there is no Census Bureau chief that has been confirmed, that it could be used as an effort to undermine or attack the integrity of the data that we're going to collect? Um, yeah, it certainly could be. Although, I, let me just say this, the Census Bureau, the Census Bureau is doing fine right now um, without a director. They've got, um, the, the Census only has three political positions anyway, and I'm, I'm one of them, and then there's, there's two others. And they have a very good career person who's acting as the director, and a very good career person who's acting as the deputy director. So. They're, they're, they're moving along right now, so it, it would be good for them to have a director. The, the big advantage of having a director um, that is, you know, confirmed by the administration is charged is that the director has great access to the administration and they have the support of the administration when they, they go to the Congress and they can push a lot harder on certain things than a career person can do, and they're going to need that as they get closer to the to the 2020 census, but in the short term, they're, they're, they're making all the progress they can. Okay, good. I know that there have been some proposals over the years to make the Census Bureau either an independent agency, or there's been talk and there's probably been some legislation about privatizing the data, and so the potentially limiting the access or having you know, all of us who use that in our jobs, having to pay for the access to that data. In your guys' opinion, do you think that's a good idea that one of these avenues is sought after? Is there something else that we should be advocating for in terms of good data? Another model that might be, you know, overcomes the funding, gives the ability to collect all this information in an efficient manner? Wow. Uh, so, so, go, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so th there, there aren't any active proposals currently under consideration for elevating the Census Bureau to, or making it an uh, independent agency, if you will. There have been efforts in the past, and I could argue either side of that, that coin. Um, I happen to, wearing my hat as the Director of Government Affairs for the Population Association of America, did take a position in support of making the Census Bureau an independent agency um, with, with some uh, provisions. Um, that talk has really fallen to the wayside, I think. There is a concern, particularly as we get closer to the decennial, we don't want to see you know, this get caught up in a politicized you know, debate about the organization of, of the Census Bureau and where it's located currently in the Department of Commerce, where it has a lot of support, by the way, I think, from both career and administration officials. Um, so I don't think that that's something that APA needs to worry about at this point in time. The, the, but I think we all of us as, um, as advocates of the um, federal statistical uh, system writ large uh, talk a lot about the principles and practices of federal statistical agencies that the National Academy of Sciences has issued and the importance of ensuring that staff on Capitol Hill and policymakers know that there are principles and practices by which we want to see federal statistical agencies managed and, and, and that the new um, political directors of these agencies follow these principles and practices is, is an important point, I think, to make in these meetings. Would you agree, John? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I well, you know, when I, I I actually really uh, thought that I was better positioned being in the Department of Commerce mm -hmm. um, because I had, uh, I had a good relationship with uh, Penny Pritzker and you know, the Secretary of Commerce. Mm -hmm. And so it's good to have a cabinet level person advocating for you. I don't know that it's, if Census was an independent agency would ever get elevated to a, a cabinet position. Probably not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, so, that, that, so that, that was really good. Again, that, that stresses though the importance of having, getting a census director <laughs> confirmed so there's someone there that can connect with Wilbur Ross and you know, have that representation mm -hmm. at the level. 
Um, um, the other thing, though, is that the Commission on Evidence-Based Policy, one of the things they're recommending, a, a big part, is creating a national secure data service, which, which would have the authority to bring together data from across the government. And this, I think, would, would, would start laying the groundwork for real efficiencies in producing federal statistics by having this ability to bring all these different data sets together and look at certain evaluations that, that we really can't do now. And also having um, a uniform process for, um, for, for applying to access uh, federal data is, I know, if, uh, I, don't, I don't know if, if you all try to get to the, to the census microdata or the other agency microdata, but um, it, it can be very problematic right now. There's, there's a different process for every agency, and they want OMB to come up and come up with a standardized way to do that, which would make access in secure environments to, to uh, researchers and individuals a lot easier. Okay. I would be concerned about um, having a private organization access to that kind of data and hold it so for privacy and ethical issues. We have uh, private jails, and I'm still wondering about that, but uh, <laughs> um, no, I, I, don't, I don't advocate for that idea for variety. I was just to say, uh, members of the business community don't advocate for it either. Not because they just not because they just don't want to pay for it, because they they, they see this as it's an important part of our, our, our the enterprise system that everyone has equal access mm -hmm. to the data from small businesses to the large corporations, and, and so everybody can sort of play fairly in that space by having equal access to data. So, good, good. So, Nader, to talk about one of your points that you just mentioned a few minutes ago about use, utilizing data not only in the federal level, but at the local level. And so we've seen a growing number of cities that are appointing chief data officers at their local level. And, you know, President Obama was the first, had the first administration that appointed the first chief federal data officer. What are your thoughts on this trend? Do you think it will keep going? And then how can these positions evolve um, to help planners at the local level in their communities use that, use that data to tell the, tell the planning story of that community? I think they can, they can have a very productive role. Um, uh, we have chief data officers, chief information officers, uh, chief innovation officers, um, um, as part of this 100 Cities Resilient Network, we have uh, chief resilience officers as well. Um, all of these are, they're not very old, but they're pretty new. It's a little bit hard to say how effective those roles are. So uh, my understanding is that, for, for example, in the case of chief resilience officers, it's a little bit hard for some of them to, to work with all of these different departments and find out their role because um, they get overwhelmed. Uh, but I think basically we need, we need a moderator. We need someone to work with all of these different departments mm -hmm. on this role as chief information officers or chief innovation officers, whatever that is. Uh, but I'm, I'm still wondering if it should be like one or two person or it should be a department or a group that's focused on that because in a lot of cases I see my colleagues who are in these roles, they get overwhelmed very easily and they're just still trying to figure out, okay, so what are the things that we're gonna touch on and what are the things that we're going to focus on? But, but I think we need something like that so it can be a person or it can be a group that does this kind of activity. So, um, but we need to think about data interoperability and all of those uh, issues to make sure that these people in these roles are are effective and they can they can do their job. But um, I personally, yeah, support that. Mary Jo, John, do either one of you have any thoughts on that? So, from a federal perspective, um, there there is a little bit of um, of not tension is not the right word, but there there is some work that has to be done to bring, you know, what, what is data quality, what are appropriate data uses 
from a, a statistical or scientific perspective. Mm -hmm. And um, then, then there's the chief information officer, which, you know, are basically these are the computing environments you use and things like that, but it's defining the right balance between the chief information officer and, let's say, a chief data officer. So let's talk a little bit about the future. Thinking into the future, you know, John, you talked a little bit about um, some of the changes that the Census Bureau is making here for the 2020 Census. And so, you know, hopefully we'll get everything worked out and get underway there. But think about 2030 or 2040. I mean, we know that our, our community, our country is changing and in different ways regarding different parameters. What are the things that we're going to need to do differently in the future to take an accurate census and to be able to track all the trends within our country? So that, that's a really timely question. Um, the census, uh, when I left, was right in the process of trying to really, really get their hands around what, what it would look like in 2030, and they'd gone to certain, they, they'd been talking, not talking, that's not right, they, they'd actually been working with a number of different groups, um, and there were a couple things that were, that were certainly being explored, and that is doing maybe a more person-based census as opposed to a household-based, and making much greater use of administrative record sources because the ability to use those is much more advanced and sort of, sort of do a rolling type census over the years. But there's still, a lot of, there's still a lot of work that has to be done to really envision what a census would be doing in 2030. Okay. So from a political perspective, I guess that's my value added to this conversation, is we have to change the environment in which funding for the Bureau is appropriated. I think members understand the ramp up and ramp down over the course of the 10 years leading up to the decennial, but with these austere budget caps that we have moving forward for the next um, 10 or so years, um, it's gonna be very hard for the Bureau to um, get the kind of resources it needs in order to prepare for the, the next decennial, which we will already be starting to prepare for soon enough. Um, so that, that's an important change that has to take place. Um, I think that that's, that's okay. Important. Not or what about from a technology angle? What do you think we need to be focusing on for 2030, 2040? I, I would, so, so it's hard for Census Bureau to focus on local data, but I would love to see them providing standards for municipalities so that they can use those standards for their own data production. I mean, there are all of these cities gathering data and uh, collecting data and providing data, uh, but there are through different, they are in different formats and in very different standards. So I would love to see something like that happening. And that standard, I think, would help a lot with um, a lot of interoperability issues that we are dealing with right now. Okay. Well, not or as you probably know, and as our planners know out here, um, we use a lot of this data and we use GIS and we build scenarios to help understand where our communities want to go, where we've been, where we want to go. And so it's, it's become a basic tool within our toolbox. And of course the data from the Census Bureau, from the American Community Survey, um, drives what we can do in GIS. So is there any thought from any of you on the future of this tool and using it with data? And do you think that we're making progress with it in order to better engage the public in local planning? So who wants to take the first crack at that one? <laughs> well, I'm very glad that uh, GIS technology is getting easier and easier to use. Like 10 years ago, working with ArcGIS desktop was hard and it was really clunky and <laughs> it was not really easy to work with. Right now, 
you can work with ArcGIS online and simply use it for even personal purposes. It's not only for, it's not a professional tool only. It's you can use it to to learn about your neighborhood and all that. And it's getting easier and easier so that people are using it in their daily lives. Yeah. And I love that. I love seeing something like that. I um, so. Um, uh, AARP Livability Index is a good example. It's, it's a, it's a mm -hmm. web-based GIS. You can go and search for the address of your neighborhood and it pops up. There is a score. You can change uh, the factors that you want to work with and, and see what is the score of the livability of my, my neighborhood based on, for example, obesity or based on income or based on rent or how all of these factors work together. And these kinds of easy to use applications that people can use for their daily lives, I think that's a huge improvement. And I'm, I'm very happy to see that. And I think it's growing so fast in probably two or three years from now, I think it's gonna be part of everyday life of people. I mean, right now people are using uh, Zillow app very easily. It's a GIS application. So I think in a very short period of time, we're gonna see this um, happening everywhere and it's gonna be very common. I'm excited about that. Great. John, any thoughts in terms, I know the Census Bureau has, has a partnership with Esri and there is linkage there. And with the on the map program, it's a little bit easier for us to use that data. Yeah, no, I mean, that's the, I'll just echo what Nader said. I mean, just looking at the, the ease with which you can use products to visualize data. Um, it, it's just growing by leaps and bounds. And uh, Tableau, for example, you know, you can bring some data into that pretty easily and do some really nice graphics. But it, there, there's, it's just, there's just been a real explosion of using geospatial technology, GIS technology to display data in ways that makes it easy to understand. Okay. Well, let me ask you one more question, and then I'll open it up to our audience here. So um, all of you be thinking of some questions, and we have a mic in the center of the room. You know, I think a lot of times for us, and even with the government, it's really not the fact that we have the data. It's really whether the data can be scaled, accessed, analyzed, and coordinated in a way that is useful to our policymakers and to us as planners and the public. You know, what are the things that we could be doing to make sure that we get better tools that allow us to analyze that data and not just be getting all this influx of information mm -hmm. that, you, that is online from the census and other agencies? Well, I think one thing you, you can be doing, and I'm sure you are, are paying attention to um, announcements in the Federal Register when there are opportunities to comment on um, the development of new tools and innovations. I mean, even the, the new race and ethnicity standards that have, I imagine you've engaged in that debate. Um, I know, for example, when wearing my PAA hat, I'm involved a lot in issues related to the National Institutes of Health, and there was just recently a request for information with respect to um, data collected through this new um, Environmental Influences on Child Health Outcomes initiative. And that was a really important opportunity for us to weigh in and, and give them some important guidance about how they could ensure these data were more accessible and usable to, to diverse um, data users, both in applied and academic settings. So I think that that's, that, that's sort of the low-hanging fruit. You know, be sure to take advantage of those opportunities when they come to you and say, you know, give us your feedback. And I know there's a, there are a lot of those opportunities, and I really defer to your, your, your policy team at APA to help determine which ones are most important for you to address. But I personally am always make, flagging those that come from the Census Bureau and from NIH for my members through PAA. Okay, why don't we open it up to our audience here and see if anyone has any questions for you all. We have Trevor with a mic. We have a mic here in the center of the room. Come on up and it looks like Andre is going to be our first taker. <laughs> so Andre, tell us your full name and way. where you're from. Sure. My name is Andre Anderson and I'm from Florida and I'm speaking 
to you today as a member of APA and not necessarily as a president of Florida chapter because I'm not sure um, I have authorization to speak on behalf of Florida <laughs> at this point. <laughs> I'm, um, I was very pleased to hear your presentation about the forward movement of the census to making it more technology based and so on. And um, I also was intrigued by that slide that showed the comparison of the undercounted folks. And um, my personal story is I had the good fortune of emigrating to, to the US when I was a kid, 15, I'm much older now. And um, I'm also a US citizen. So I am not one of those um, hidden or undocumented um, immigrants. I um, I'm proud to be an American and enjoy the, the ability to, to live in this country. But um, I'm very concerned that um, with the challenges that we're facing right now with um, the crackdown on undocumented immigrants and the hidden population, whatever that might be, um, whether it's youth or homeless and others and veterans and, and so on, um, that we're not getting a good picture of our actual populations locally. And um, whether they exist or not, whether it's undocumented or not, they do exist and they impact our communities as far as providing services for them. And um, I would like to hear a little bit more about how we address it. I, I, you mentioned something about a third party, some other things. Is there, what exactly are we doing to kind of narrow that gap so we can accurately reflect those folks because again, they're very concerned, they're very scared, they don't wanna talk to anyone, they see a form, they're gonna throw in the mail. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, it's a huge concern for me personally, um, having you know, been an immigrant, but again, not undocumented, but went through the channels to become a US citizen. Thank you. So, Census is going to be um, very, very active in reaching out to communities in a number of ways. One way that I think a number of you have probably been involved in is they work with local governments to form complete count committees, which uh, bring together local forces to work with the Census Bureau to address how in their community they will, um, will, will, will get a good count. And Census has guidelines on how to establish um, a complete count committee. And uh, that, 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 that is a really good start for a local government in terms of getting everyone counted. Are there guidelines or um, other things that they have for this committee in terms of maybe multiple languages, um, you know, especially with the diversity <coughs> increasing in our, our country? So they, they do plan to have a very active language program. But again, this is, this is where it's, it's almost like a broken record, but they need to be spending more money right now to catch up and get this program underway in, in, a, in a big way. I mean, they, right now they have 46 individuals that they've hired to, um, to do this partnership program nationally. Well, 46 people is not going to do, that's not even one per state, but it's not gonna be anywhere near the effort they need to, um, to, to put in place to get to the mm -hmm. local communities and provide them information to get the materials printed up in various languages, you know, to get, and, and printing's just the, not necessarily to be digitally available so you can, they can be downloaded. There's just a lot of work that has to happen and um, it, as I said, a lot of it's been deferred, and so. Hmm. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, good afternoon, Max Sokol, president of the New York Metro chapter. Similar to Andre, I'm not representing the chapter with this question, but um, great panel. Um, I have two questions trying to think about why we're here um, for this conference and sort of in the near term. First, um, with the theme of advocacy being part of why we're here, um, some of us are going up to Capitol Hill on Tuesday um, to try and both represent ourselves as well as the organization with specific asks for funding. Um, John, you were pretty clear about uh, specific funding needs that the Census Bureau needs. 
Is there a concise message that we can deliver? Um, I know the $200 million number was referenced. Is there something no, no, no. specific? So Mar Mary Jo has, <laughs> her organization has some really good talking points. Um, Great. Uh, yeah, we do. This, thank you, John. You know, the Census Project is a, a wealth of resources on our homepage, thecensusproject.org, and I'm sure they've incorporated some of our messages and the materials that you've been reviewing and preparing for your advocacy day. Um, yeah, members and staff get hung up on numbers. They would So to give them a number, we have been advocating for an additional $300 million for the Census Bureau overall. I think John's numbers were more speaking to the decennial. Right. But we're asking, more, we're asking for $1.8 billion for the Census Bureau in fiscal year 18, which is a $300 million increase. Um, so that would be, and, and the, there are a number of reasons why, and I think that that's when you really do wear your, your hat as a, a local representative about what that funding would mean for you and your interests. Great, thank you. And one follow-up question. Um, National Community Planning Month is coming up shortly. Um, the theme is innovation and planning, which seems to be apropos given what we're talking about. Um, it's great that there is a representation from APA National and division leadership. Is there anything locally that the chapters can be doing um, around the country to be supporting the message that we're conveying here tonight? Sophia, would you like to respond to this? All right, I'm sorry. Tell me again. <laughs> I'm just more concerned about my skirt. <laughs> so. Is, is there anything that um, locally that the chapters can be doing to be supporting the message that we're talking about here tonight? Yeah, I think looking at advocacy at your local chapter level working with your, liais your legislative liaisons that you have, that each chapter has, and you know, taking the stuff that we have developed at the national level and you know, utilizing those tools and those templates, you know, crafting that message down to get to, so your people at home in your chapters can meet with the representatives mm -hmm. to the organization or meet with the representatives to the Senate to the, their house, the House of Representatives, and then you know make have that message at home. You know, letter writing campaigns. We also we've done a great job this year of being able for our members to go in and type their name in and their zip code, and it automatically pulls in their that information and the congressional leader or congressional leaders from their district, and then they can send emails to them regarding this information. So I would um, encourage you to utilize all the tools that we have, work with um, your state liaisons. And I will also say, we as an organization are moving towards having state captains or state chairs, trying to take what we do at the national level and really make it robust at the state and grassroots level. And so we have four states that have um, signed on to that program and I ident have identified that person. Um, it would be helpful if we have other chapters, other states who are able to do that, that we could really become robust. Because I think as Mary Jo would say, what really becomes effective with our lo local legislation, our local legislators, state legislators, is that they're hearing from local planners and local citizens that are in their district that they represent. And the more people that we could get out and reach to them about our concerns regarding data, the more successful we will be in terms of changing that legislation. Great. Can I add something? Oh, sure, go ahead. Um, and going back to your idea about innovation and also how, what chapters can do, um, divisions are very excited in, work, in, in working with chapters and these kinds of things. and like organizing local activities. Um, so if you are interested in that, you can, you can follow up with different chapters depending on the type of activity you would like to do. And they are very open to that. So our chapter would be happy to co-sponsor an event if you're interested in doing something related to technology and innovation. So that can be an idea. I just hope, I have a lot of nerve talking about your initiative. I have no idea what it entails, but I hope it includes a very strong social media component as you know, our president is 
a big fan of Twitter. Members of Congress are big fans of Twitter. <laughs> Letter writing campaigns are great, but honestly, oh. in this new age on Capitol Hill, and you'll hear this when you're with offices, in fact, you probably were told by, in your advocacy training, tweet at these offices before you go to them. Tell them you're excited to see them. You know, Start laying the groundwork now so when you later are tweeting about your your monthly, uh, your activities related to this month that they're sort of set the stage and know who you are and what, why you're interested in. Great. Right. Thank topics. you all. Okay, well, that comes up to our six o'clock oh. hour. Oh, do we have one more question? Oh, two more. Is it okay? I'm trying to find my staff. Okay. We're, yeah, my we're name good. is Bonnie Kranzer. I uh, teach uh, water resources planning at the Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, so very nearby. I was struck by the lack of going through this stuff about federal data that I didn't see anything on the list of what's considered kind of the primary, having anything to do with environmental data such as data such as EPA, FEMA, US Geological Survey, <laughs> NOAA, and I know there's a lot of us use that type of data in planning. And, I, and with the climate change issues, and are there any activities abroad on trying to either save, salvage, manage, or you know, keep going the, the validity and reliability of that type of data that we need for the environmental resources, not just as well as our social and welfare. I'm just curious where you are on that, because it's not looking very good. <laughs> yeah, so I, 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 I was a little remiss. I did speak mostly about the federal statistical system. The Department of Commerce is, is in its essence, is, is really a huge data agency. And so you've got census, you've got the Bureau of Economic Analysis, you've got NOAA with all their, their data, you've got NIST, and you've got the Patent and Trademark Office. And um, they, 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 are, they are still there and they're still producing all that data. NOAA's producing, it's, I don't know what, what the word is bigger than terabyte, but <laughs> 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 the, all that data is coming out and being used. Um, so I should. Okay, last question. It's a good one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> I guess we'll find out. Um, my name is Charles. I'm from Tucson, Arizona. Um, my question is, and I may get some of the details wrong, that but in the 2010 census, census there were some issues that caused um, uh, cost overrun of a couple of billion dollars. Um, so I was just hoping if you could explain what those issues were, um, how it plays into how and if what they're trying to do differently this year, how and if it plays into the politics of funding it for 2020. And I ask that in the context of us going up to Capitol Hill and talking about this, um, that's often used as kind of one of the arrows against funding the census and a knock against the Bureau. Um, so I'm just trying to better understand the issue as we head up there. Sure. So. Um I was on the outside when this happened, but I did get to weigh in on it. So leading up to the um, 2010 census, the Census Bureau had a vision of using handheld devices to conduct the census. And they had a large contract that was in place to do that. The contract didn't get managed very well, and they had to scrap the program at the last minute. Well last minute being the, the year ended in eight, and um, go back to a, a paper-based methodology. The impact of that was it required a lot more money coming into the Census Bureau to support the paper-based. So the important difference between what happened in 2010 and what's going on now is that there never was a handheld device to really be tested in any kind of program. So Census has tested a smartphone as the device going back to 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016. Um, so the, 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 it's more than just this sort of concept that's out there that hasn't been done. It's been, it's been done. The other important thing is Census made a huge commitment to use existing technology and not, not using cutting edge. So everything they're doing is existing. Even the, the, the kind of optimization they're doing, they're not, they're not reinventing optimized route planning and things like that. They're using what, what exists in the industry to do optimized route planning. And um, 
they're going to be be doing this in in a cloud environment. They've already done the public facing systems in the cloud environment. So the point is, census is way ahead of where they were in the 2010 cycle. They even issued a, an operational plan, a, a pretty detailed plan in 2015, which was you know three years earlier than they than they'd done anything like that in previous censuses. So they they've really been focused on good planning and using existing technology. But unfortunately, Congress hasn't provided the resources of the same scale, right? So I think the important message, too, is you have an opportunity now to get this right. They have an opportunity to test these technologies that are very different from what was used in the previous decade, that they attempted to use in the previous decade. But Congress needs to do its, its part and provide the resources. And that's why it's terrific that you're going up there and are going to be conveying this message to them. Okay, well, thank you all for attending. Let's give a big round of applause for everyone.